My name is Natalia de Esteban Ubeda. I think that by that surname, you might realize that I'm not American, I'm not English, despite being based in London for the last 20 years. I'm actually from Spain. Having spent the last 12 years of my career in transport from London, I'm going to talk to you about transportation, and I acknowledge that my view here may be tinted a little bit about that public sector view. I've spent a large part of my career in the private sector as well, so I'm not coming here as a former public servant, but I'm going to give you an optimistic, however realistic, uh, view of transportation challenges in cities. Again, bear with me because this is um, going to come from a what do we do in real life if we move beyond the hyper PR headlines of automation, for instance, of robotic cities, of artificial humans, of flying cars. So all of that is very good, and I'm not going to belittle those technological advances, but I'm here to give a vision also of what it takes to implement these systems. Uh, formerly, I was the head of technology in Transport for London, responsible for deploying more technology on the road space. And then I moved to be head of innovation where an organization like TFL was an integrated transport provider in the city, was looking at what's going on out there that we should be doing. So let me start by telling you a few things that we probably know, but I'm going to perhaps take the obvious that we're moving towards an electric, shared, fleet, automated type of transportation system. But it'd be a lot easier to have this conversation if I was just to talk about uh, robot urban labs and perhaps pick up on some of the technology trends that cities like Tokyo, Singapore, and Dubai are exemplifying. However, I believe that there are more complex subjects here to be discussed, which is, you know, some of you have raised in urban sized cities. And I'm here with that deployment perspective. All those technology advances are very good, but how does it really work in reality? Sometimes we concentrate on what we do or what needs to happen, but not on the how. And the how is a tremendous a component of this because, as you will see in a minute, there are elements of these deployments that are influenced by far more than technology availability. So readiness of policy, regulation, and political stability, for instance. But let me start by uh, acknowledging what some of you have raised before, which is the people challenge. One of the major issues in transportation in the cities is going to be influenced by the growth in population that is going to put additional demands on the transportation system. And by transportation system, in this case, I'm mentioning specifically mass transit, your buses and your underground systems. Um, I'll talk about congestion as well, but um, we should not underestimate what um, having, for instance, two busloads of people coming into a city day, hour after hour, in addition to current population is doing. So in London, we've talked about um, the city of Manchester, for instance, moving on to the city of London. That is the expectation of population rise in London in the next few years, and how the um, underground system, the bus system is going to cope with that, because you're going to get to a point of saturation, no matter how much technology to deploy. Um, the issue with population growth um, bears also the issue of accessibility, both from an urban mobility, those mobility impaired when the system is actually quite crowded, um, people with um, no step access, they're going to have further challenges. And we need to acknowledge that, but not also on the social mobility impaired people, but also on the digital <coughs> inclusion side. All that we're getting used to these days that you book your transportation means, that you work your route, your best options through your phone that typically would have costed you at least six to one thousand dollars. Well, what does how does it leave those that do not have access to digital means? And I think social inclusion, while it's not a very popular subject sometimes, has to be taken into this picture. Um, we're talking about an aging population that have mobility issues, but also digital issues. So I'm coming with a bit of a social agenda as well as a technological agenda, and I think the complexity of integrating both is huge. I'm going to give you a very broad brush on some of the issues about the pollution challenge. Yes, technology, yes, electrification of the, of the road network, charging systems, dynamic charging, 
All of that is great, and an increasing fleet of vehicles that is green. But have you thought about the availability of charging networks in the city? Can you plug 1,000 vehicles at the same time? How about 10,000 vehicles? How about the whole city being plugged into the grid? Have you thought about the energy balance, the affordability of that for the city and what the city needs to do to upgrade to be able to do that? It's a little bit like chicken and egg, where you can have, you can encourage the uptake of electric vehicles, you can tax the traditional vehicles, you can't charge the thing, you're not gonna drive the thing. So I think we need to be mindful of what level of investment and upgrade the city needs to do with all these digital upgrades. Um, the paradox of technology pace versus the pace that the public sector, uh, the public authorities work. Uh, technology availability, we've all seen on the news. Uh, you've actually heard about the trials that are happening with automated vehicles and everything else, the hyperloops, the drones, the flying cars in Dubai. But at what pace does the public sector work? What's the ability of a mayor of a city to turn around those ideas, some of which may not be feasible in an electoral term? So if you think about a four or five year horizon, how much of that is stable? I've worked for three mayors in London. Um, left, right, left. Um, I've seen things being implemented and taken down and implemented again. And for technological advance, that's good in a way where you have step change. But in terms of continuity, the uh, effect on the transportation system, where now we put a congestion <coughs> charge zone, we invest in that, now we take it out. Now we put it back in, now we take it out. So perhaps I'm exaggerating a little bit, but to put a subject on, on the table today, which is that of the impact of political stability and role on uh, technology enabling. And sometimes we make it obvious to think about policy, and regulation. Uh, when I've spoken in the past about policy and regulation, people tend to yawn. This is the boring stuff, it's not the sex, it's talking about some of these uh, technologies. But I'm here to present, to invite you to consider that technology is great, but think about regulation in, as a way to facilitate the technology deployment. Not regulation as a way to hamper it, to put it to bed, to say, no, you can't do this. I come from a body that had huge regulatory powers it compares to other authorities in the world, and some of which have ended up in court, some of which have ended up in bad press, but I have seen how public sector has played catch up with regards to regulation and policy. And I'm going to give you two examples, and so you know with a little bit more meat what I'm talking about. Um, the dockless bicycles, otherwise known as the Chinese bikes, those that don't need you to put them anywhere, you can just drop them that have been hugely deployed in Asia, Shanghai, and there's a lot of examples around the world. Well, in London, we knew they were going to disembark the day before they were dumped in London. And what we had to do is a huge policy uh, effort to try to make them work for the city. And here I'm giving another message, which is sometimes what's good for the end consumer in transportation terms may not be good for the city as a whole. So you want your cheaper systems, you want to get your bike here, and leave it there, you don't want to find a docking station, you don't want to have to uh, fiddle with the machine, pay for your phone. But if you have like a hundred thousand of these things dumped at the front desk as the entrance of a station, like Waterloo Station, what do you do with that? As a city, what is your responsibility? What about the threat? Um, that could cause the chaos of finding you know, people not able to access the city. So sometimes all these technologies enabling is things that are very good and very wanted by the end consumer, but not so good for the city as a whole. Um, I think some of you may expect me to talk about automation and advanced systems, and I will, but I will do so, hopefully going beyond the PR stance of such and such company has done 100 million miles without a driver or someone else crashed. Um, I'm here to, to propose that we consider a phase in automation, automated vehicles, drones, I'm bringing all the, the, the same banner here, where we need to discuss what happens with transition systems. By this I mean 
the old vehicles, so the legacy, and the new stuff. Because regardless of technology availability, we're going to have a situation where at some point we're going to have those little mini pops perhaps, when on their own, or perhaps bigger people carriers without a driver, and still people who are going to drive not only their automatic vehicle on fuel, but also their manual vehicles. And the coexistence of legacy systems and new systems is far more complex than actually deploying a few hundred poles somewhere and they drive on their own and they're great. Now, we need to look at also the um, unintended consequences of all these systems. We have situations where people expect that uh, congestion is going to be decreasing because you're going to have smaller poles, they're going to drive differently, you're going to be um, perhaps planning different layouts because they can take the bends at different angles, you can have them in tunnels. Yes, but what's going to happen with all that time that the vehicles are actually not used? Oh, you just send them away and then they'll come back and get you whenever. And, and if you send them away, where do you think they're going to go? Because you cannot send them away like miles and miles away because when you push your button, you want them back. <laughs> so there's an issue about uh, ghost vehicles and intended consequences of, yeah, I want my vehicle right now because the rest of the time I'm going to be doing something else. What do you put there? What, what happens to them? Like, we're moving increasingly to a situation that is not very popular amongst politicians, picking up on my previous point, which is that of taxation. Dynamic road pricing and other um, systems regarding incentives and deterrence are going to come into the fold even more so. How am I doing time? Three times, three minutes. Um, so look beyond those uh, perhaps PR stance of technology availability and all those fancy demonstrations, which are great because they're showcasing the technologies available. But look at what needs to happen for these systems really to exist. And again, um, a little bit influenced by um, having been the regulator in the past, look at what regulation we need to talk about amongst ourselves. What's good policy? What's good city governance? And what do we need to make it happen? Deploying a system is far more complicated than actually working on this component part in technological ways. Um, I've talked about the, uh, the dockless bikes, a, a little bit on automated systems, but I'm going to leave you with a few ideas of what I believe to be subjects that we perhaps don't talk enough about. I'm sure there are specialist groups talking about discussing these issues, but I don't think they're brought in the, into the agenda as much as some of these automated vehicles, drones, hyperloop. Some of these are, I've mentioned regulation, I'll say it again, I'm going to talk about the intercity challenge. We're here talking about cities, but very rarely you're just in the city. You go from A to B, things happen between cities. So what are the transportation challenges going forward for intercity connections? So we need to talk about the same road pricing that happens in the cities will be happening elsewhere, but in more of a highway environment. Again, that's not a very political, palatable choice. What's happening with freight? You know, cities need to be serviced. In London, in 2012, we changed the way freight operated in the city, and we changed it for a few months completely. Night deliveries, restrictions on deliveries, and if you think about not just the big trucks, but the, the white vans, the ones that get your Amazons to place, those vehicles are not as regulated as the bigger fleets are or controlled or visible and yet they're causing masses of congestion. So what I'm thinking is, look forward into that freight and supply chain reality. When we talk about automation, and I think our colleague from cybersecurity may pick up on this later, is the issue of supply chain security. You know how easy it is to hack any element of a supply chain of an automated vehicle? You can secure your automated vehicle, you don't have a clue where your components come from, you don't apply any checks across a huge amount of players, then you know, you're at risk. I don't think we talk about that enough. Um, the use of urban land is changing. Automated vehicles will change the shape of our cities. And yes, we'll have different roads, but have we thought about who's financing those? If the public sector has to make a choice between fixing potholes that kill cyclists or doing a fancy tunnel 
with very limited budget, then what do you think we're going to choose? What do you think is the first budget that goes away and evaporates in front of a business case that doesn't have any funds? The fancy one, the technology one perhaps. The inequality of the digital era, which I've mentioned enough, seems to be a little bit of now we're talking about the social inclusion agenda. But think about this. If we don't enable those who do not have access to have access, you're opening a huge gap in society and in the transportation system because people will not be able to use it. And my last message today is that of a systemic approach to this challenge. It takes a huge amount of time to change a system. There are wonderful examples out there like the mobile, um, how long it took before the mobile technology, uh, mobile phone technology was ready until it was fully de deployed and implemented. But if you think about automation, yes, it's ready to a certain degree in some other areas, and there are huge debates about level three, level four, hands off, hands off. <coughs> yes, fantastic, but how long is it going to change, uh, is going to take to change the whole system? And thinking about little things, like today you take your car to pass their, what in, in the UK is called the MOT, so the check that you, you've got your car already. What does the MOT look like in an automated world? So I'm inviting you to think about the things that we don't typically put in the agenda, but leaving you with the systemic change, which is rather far more complex. Thank you.